Greetings. Today I am going to continue talking to you about my technique that I call scriptorium. And the further title I've given here, illustrated in color, is not just a colorful turn of phrase. It's a promise that I'm going to show you some colorful examples of my own work. Perhaps I should have done that last time already, but I didn't know what a wonderful reception I would get from you when I presented my whole idea about the aesthetic artistic side of scriptorium. I was actually a little bit nervous that people would think that it was kind of flaky, it didn't really have to do with language learning, which is what this channel is supposed to be all about. And so I was just overjoyed to see the number of people that said that they loved the idea of creating manuscripts or integrating their artistic side and in particular are interested in, in different scripts and ancient languages, medieval languages. So that really encourages me to continue sharing with you along these notes about the fact that this kind of thing, this kind of creating something beautiful at the same time you were memorizing, internalizing, learning to recite, creating your own copy of something that has deep value, meaning, something that has spiritual, religious, psychological, philosophical, literary, cultural value. Um, there's just something amazingly satisfying about this, more satisfying than other aspects or, or time periods of, of, of my life as a language learner. And I would go further to say that in particular, the whole diachronic aspect of this, learning to art access something that was first articulated perhaps hundreds or thousands of years ago in the language that it was articulated in, uh, that in and of itself to me is mind expanding in, in a way, consciousness expanding in a way that mindfulness meditation and all these other things are supposed to be, but in my experience with them, they pale next to the whole experience of, of practicing polyliteracy in this fashion, which is why I use that term practice so often. I really do feel that this is kind of, when you're doing this kind of thing, it's a structured way to live your life and to put value and meaning into the things that you see as, as, as being particularly important and valuable. So with that said, let me show you, or try to show you some examples. The camera can be finicky. I can't get too close. It won't be very clear, I'm afraid. There might become a colored streak, but uh, I'm gonna try to show you some examples of things that I've done at various points in the past because there were so many questions about what kind of pen or ink or book I favored. Should I should do one uh, languages on one page or another? There's no right answer to any of these things. I'll just show you some examples of stuff that I've done. So at one point, a couple of years ago, I was working on Egyptian hieroglyphs. Fascinating to me that these pictures here are words and ideas. And I was also doing A languages and B languages. I described that last time as a maintenance routine. You could, uh, if you had too many languages, maybe do on alternate days. So on the days that I did Egyptian hieroglyphs, my A languages were French. I've got uh, La Légion des Siècles de Victor Hugo ici, and then some medieval um, medieval Latin morality tales that I'm trying to copy in medieval script, some Arabic from Arabian and One Nights, uh, something in um, Hindi here. I've got an Old Norse saga written in runes and something in Greek. So uh, I'm doing this by time so the spaces are, are slightly different each day uh, and I try to use a different color for each language. And on B days back then, I was working on Mayan Hieroglyphs, well, this is more of an illustration from the Popol Vuh, the Book of the Dead. And in the B languages, I had Spanish, I said Cuentos de Borges, and then Rascas Targenieva, and something in Sanskrit, I forget what that was, something in Persian. I've got in uh, Hanja and Hangul, the Pulgyo Songjong, uh, some Buddhist teachings. Uh, and then uh, in Svenska Meditiden Zarin Kronikor, I've got written in the uh, ancient or the old German Sutilin handwriting because um, why not? And then uh, the Mayan glyphs themselves, I had, uh, I didn't illustrate, uh, always do color, uh, that takes a lot of time. For the coloring, I used pencils for the most part at this stage, but um, I'll just show you some other, I think I need to switch to another screen so this red line doesn't come up. Um, there's some more Egyptian hieroglyphs in the same A languages and some of these fantastic 
illustrations from the Popol Vuh, and that list of B languages. So I filled, see a large, uh, I prefer blank page books for this. Um, and that's one way of doing it. And then you know, I haven't filled in the illustrations. I'll hold this sideways so you can see another way. I hope you can see that. I don't have the illustrations here yet, but this is um, when you're doing it by space. I mentioned last time when you've got more of a text. So I've got something in Arabic, Russian, Persian, and Hindi here. Um, and so they've got the same space allocated to each of them. And uh, likewise, go on through that. And then at another stage, I haven't talked about this, um, but another stage, um, I integrated the pictures into the text when I was doing more, uh, this is even more advanced stage, when I'm, I'm, I'm actually composing here. I've got some ideas for stories that I'm trying to write in German and some Latin, um, Latin prayers down here uh, and some can fantastic cats. Uh, you may recognize Merlin here. Merlin was in my lap last time. He's probably going to walk across the screen. A griffin. Um, some other things. Integrating text and and writing together. So these are just some examples of scriptoria. As you see, I prefer large size blank page books. Um, I like fountain pens. These are like no name brand uh, cheap fountain pens, but I can refill them with all different kinds of ink that I can mix in myself and I don't have to worry about uh, breaking them or losing them. They work just fine. So that's what I like to do and use. So um, there's no correct way to do the artwork or the, the procedure itself. And there's no correct way to, to do scriptorium. Um, I got, I would say most of the questions that came in were along the lines of, can I do it this way? Should I do this? Should I do that? Um, there is no one correct way. There's always any technique that you learn, you know, probably you should emulate the way that you see somebody doing it, but then you adapt it and you be creative about um, adapting it and doing different things with it. So uh, there was one really cogent question about the whole, um, when should you check back? So this is not a test. I mean, you're, you're cheating yourself if you try to do this silently and rush through it, but nobody is, it's not cheating if you read a phrase or a part of the sentence aloud, and then while you're writing it, if you, you're unsure, you want to check before you um, make a mistake, that's fine. There's no problem with doing that. Um, that whole checking for mistakes thing seemed to trip some people up. Um, you can do that at any stage of the process. Um, you can write your notes on the same page or on a separate page. I would prefer to do it on a separate page, but if working on the same page works for you, that's fine. Um, people ask sort of about these variations on a theme. Was it okay? Anything you can do if it works for you is, is more than okay. It's something you should do. So some of the things that people suggested were um, dual columns, uh, writing maybe the transcription in one column and writing notes on another. If you have a lot of notes, that would be a fine thing to do. Um, pausing to think and speak aloud, uh, being prompted by what you read to say something, that, that sounds wonderful. Um, preparing, uh, this person was saying he, maybe he wanted to uh, transcribe some sentences of Marcel Proust, and that would obviously, sometimes his sentences are a page long, that would be very hard to do. So. Um, in that case, obviously, I would recommend reading a sentence fragment, not the whole thing, but this person wondered how about um, writing out the first letter as a, as a mnemonic prompt to help you recite this. If that's something that was interesting to you, then by all means, please, please do that. <clears throat> I would like to talk a little bit, because it did seem to come up as cogent, about things that you can do or focus on at different stages of, of your learning or your language level when you're doing scriptorium. So at the beginning stage, I would say scriptorium is most valuable. I mentioned last time, it's more of an intermediate and advanced technique than a beginning technique. But at the beginning stages, I would highly recommend it above all for different scripts. It's particularly useful when you're really getting used to writing in different scripts. This is a perfect way to, to learn to, um, to do it. Uh, and then if you can write them, you can read them. So this is extremely useful for that, <clears throat> particularly useful. Uh, one person asked in particular about writing 
uh, kanji, I call them hanja in Korean, uh, glyphs, uh, any kind of glyphs, Mayan glyphs, Egyptian glyphs. Um, if you're doing that, then this is a time when you really need to be careful and check while you're writing, because if you make one error, one line, one thing in, 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 in a hanja, it can totally change the meaning of it. So this is a time to be careful about that. Somebody else asked about <clears throat> the difficulty of lack of vowels in Hebrew or Arabic texts. And I think this person was working with Hebrew and uh, I'm not, I'm sorry, I don't know if this is available in Hebrew as it is in Arabic. In Arabic, this just was not really an issue because yes, there are a lot of texts that lack vowels and there's a general sense that uh, you know most, most newspapers or novels are published without them, but there are plenty, plenty of uh, books in Arabic, at least, that you can find with vowels written in well-printed books, expensive books, uh, books of older texts, precisely the kind that you're going to look at. You look at the Muqaddimah in Khaldun, that has the vowels written in it. Anything that has religious or spiritual value has the vowels written in it. Anything that's written for for children all, all the way up to high school has vowels written in it. So it's not a hard thing to find an Arabic text that has vowels, and then you can either read them there, and you may even want to write them itself. And uh, I would hope and imagine the same is true for um, for, for Hebrew texts. So uh, look for something for probably for for uh, that's used in schools. <clears throat> um, at the intermediate stage, again, the intermediate stage is probably where this technique. Uh, for language learners, for your normal learner, and again, a normal learner to me is somebody who's not obsessed with learning languages the way polyglots and polyliterate people are. We're obsessed, we're, we're passionate about it, um, but let's call a spade a spade. It's an obsession, and a normal learner doesn't necessarily have that, uh, but has a, a healthy desire to master a language or two. Uh, and so this intermediate stage for them, or for us, is uh, this is the time when I think it's very good to work on internalizing the text, particularly if you're working with, say, an assimil or a linguaphone type material that has a lot of stuff that you can have listened to and shadowed and also now be doing this with it. More than anything else, I would say this is the stage when that sort of not nagging checking for details, but um, checking of points. This is, there comes a time when you're, when you're learning a language when somehow you can get a little bit, um, I don't want to say sloppy or careless, but there's always a word that you look up and you don't retain the meaning and eventually you just say, well, I'll look it up next time and next time somehow it never comes and you're kind of, it's, it doesn't really matter so you can leave it a little bit hazy and you can do that and so there's things that you can sort of skimp on that um, you'd really rather not but if you're just speaking and running around and, and doing things you might have time to check but when you're slowed down and doing this and you catch them at this stage, this is the point when you should look them up. This is the time to catch them and, and really to uh, refine that, polish things off, and, and not let these kind of things slip by you. <clears throat> um, another person uh, mentioned that he knew, I think, seven languages to a fairly high level that he felt he could say he knew them, knew them and using them, and then he had maybe two or three others that he was like, <laughs> Should I let them go? Should I not do this? Can I, can I work them into a scriptorium routine? And that's where I mentioned last time, you would have to try it and see if it's true for you as well. I believe it will be that even doing five minutes a day of scriptorium is, as I called it, tending the garden. It's like watering the plants. So I would say watering and take a sip of water. <clears throat> um, it is a, a way that you can keep the thing alive. And when you keep it alive, you keep it from being in the back burner, you keep it simmering, and somehow that that action in itself makes it more present in your mind and gives you more opportunities to make it even further alive. So um, I think that this is a, a perfect way to juggle those languages at an intermediate stage. And <clears throat> then the other, another topic came up, um, people asking, that's a simple fact that it, it is can be frustrating how long you're stuck at the intermediate stage. Uh, it's the simple fact that particularly once you have enough experience learning languages to go from no knowledge to beginning knowledge is, is easy. To go from beginning knowledge to master a, a, a textbook or two to intermediate knowledge is also just a question of a little bit more time. But to go from the point where you say, well, I've, I've worked through a couple of textbooks, I understand everything here, I, I can shadow or listen or copy this and, and get it. But then when I turn to a novel and pick it up, 
God, that's hard. I, I just really can't do it. I have to, maybe I can use a, a, a translation of something for young adults, like a Harry Potter novel, and, and kind of get the gist. But if I try to turn to something that's original, authentic material, it's it's just so far above me that it's dispiriting after all the time that I've put into it. There isn't um, a cure for this except time. I'm continuing to work hard at it. I have made many videos about this in the past, about expanding your vocabulary, <coughs> um, reading, using readers and stuff like this. The only thing I would add at this stage is that it came up in a, a discussion not too long ago about interlinear texts. And interlinear texts, if you can find them or make them by taking the pages of a reader and photocopying them a large and then writing the vocabulary that they give you under the words, um, that's kind of tedious when you just try to, to read that. But when you do that with Scriptorium, that's a good way to internalize this. So. Um, that is a way that Scriptorium can take you on that long hump, that long road to um, towards getting more advanced. When you get advanced, when you are advanced, then, uh, as I mentioned last time, this is a time when you should be focusing on emulating the style, learning how to write in the same way that an author who writes the way you would like to write, writes. And so this is a stage when you can speed up a little bit. You don't have to do it as slow. I mean, you're not looking for errors or mistakes here. You're looking to, um, to, to learn how to write like he writes. And you can do that uh, if you are, this person who asked this question was frustrated, I think said reading a novel is so fast and then you try to do this, it's, it's too slow. Again, you don't need to do the whole thing this slow. Maybe you just want to concentrate on passages that you particularly like rather than transcribing a, a whole novel. Um, and uh, yeah, I just I just think of I mentioned I was I love Borges, Jorge Luis Borges, and and was transcribing his stories, and he has one called uh, it's about somebody who recreates Don Quixote uh, by not by copying it, but by writing it on his own. So really emulating the style and and, and doing something like that. Uh, another thing you can focus on at the advanced stage is again, I mean, a, a novel is a great thing to sort of bridge that practice level. That's you saw me working in my. A, B, uh, six languages a day, um, sort of maintenance routine using 19th and 20th century literary texts. That's fine to do with that. But if you're going to create a whole manuscript, if you're going to really create something of, of lasting value, you probably want to do something older. So uh, at the advanced stage, if you're frustrated by the sort of the slowness of it, you can focus on that artistic aesthetic side, focus on creating the manuscript on a lasting work. So. <clears throat> this is all things that you would do as a polyliterate practice. And there were keep coming questions about naturally, about, you know, sort of I mentioned that maybe I'm creating, I'm probably the only person out there talking about polyliteracy, sort of uh, sort of not versus polyglottery, but making it different or as a subset or a branch or a subset. So what do I mean? What am I talking about? Well, in my experience, polyglots. I would say they tend to, because these are broad generalizations, they'll fit everybody. And you know, I'm I'm a polyglot and I'm polyliterate. You can overlap, you can you can be both. But um, polyglots, in my experience, they tend to be focused on spoken communication first and foremost. The whole reason they love languages is they love speaking to other people. They love being able to trans travel to other countries and break down that communication barrier and go up to people who don't expect them to know their language and be able to, to speak to them. That, that, that whole act of conquering the, the spoken word is what drives most of the polyglots of my acquaintance, people that have met at polyglot conferences and other people when they find that you're enthusiastic about languages. It's always that question, how many languages do you speak? They're focused on the spoken language. <clears throat> Because it's spoken, they tend to be focused only on living languages. Um, if you try to get some conversations going about your Middle High German or your um, your Pali or something like this at, at, at a polyglot conference, you're not going to find that many people that you can talk with about that. Um, you're also going to find that in general, polyglots, uh, because they want to be speaking to people, um, they tend to favor acquisition over learning. They would like to be able to learn it as swiftly, get, be able to use it as swiftly as possible. Uh, I've met plenty of polyglots who, who are fascinated by grammar, who love talking about it, but I've met more who kind of see like, well, I don't want to make a lot of mistakes, so I guess I need to intuit and know it on some level, but um, 
grammar is not a lot of fun for most of them, I would say. And uh, because of that, these kind of things, they're kind of happy to be out of school and out in the world, traveling about and, and encountering other people and doing things. Um, I would say that most of the polyglots that I've met have no more, no less than any other group of people. Um, have no particular interest in, in, in literature uh, as a whole. Um, some do, some don't, but as, as a large group, it's not like, oh, we're learning languages so we can access the literature. <clears throat> Whereas that is a case for polyliterate people. Polyliterate people tend to, and again, it's a broad generalization, to be focused first and foremost on the written language because you want to read it, kind of analyze it. You want to understand how it works. You want to see the beautiful scripts that it comes in. Um, so that's the main thing. Polyglots. I've never met a polyglot who's poly who is po illiterate. Well, what, maybe some people when they're struggling with Chinese or Japanese or something that's particularly hard. But all poly ah, all polyglots are literate in the sense that you know, modern citizens are literate. They can read uh, labels and newspapers and stuff like this. But when it comes to really uh, delving into books um, as, a, as a primary cause for learning languages, that's more of a, a polyliterate turn of mind. Um, and because of that, and all the other things we've talked about, there is this diachronic interest among uh, people. Well, I don't know which, which is first, the chicken or the egg. If you're interested in diachronic languages, then you're likely to become more interested in saying, I'm, I'm, gonna, I wanna, I'm interested in reading in books. I'm interested because you, you, you can't speak Middle High German or Ancient Egyptian. Uh, well, Asimil's got some, some recordings of Egyptian now. Um, but basically, uh, if you're interested in ancient and medieval languages, that's what I call diachronic interest. That's a, a hallmark of, of polyliteracy. Um, polyliterate people uh, is, I would say, that they, they prefer um, learning to acquisition. They prefer, they like studying. Uh, they tend to find grammar fascinating. And when it comes to school, I would say that uh, we tend to wish there were more of a place for us in the schools and in the academies and a place where you could um, stay and do this kind of thing, because it seems like you should be able to do it in, in an academic environment, but there unfortunately isn't much of a, of a spot for us there. Um, and then I would say that, yes, if you're Again, I don't know which is first, the chicken or the egg here. If you're interested in literature, first and foremost, literature in general, good books, reading, novels, uh, and then in particular, the great books, traditions, those those ancient works of, of spiritual and, and philosophical and religious and cultural value. Um, if this is a main driving force in why you are interested in learning languages, then you are um, following the lines that I'm talking about when I'm talking about polyliteracy. So I can't explain that thoroughly in a slide or, or even a set of slides or even, a, even a, a whole talk. So I was giving some thought to this brave new world that we live in where it's really hard to travel and I haven't been to live conferences since 2019 and I haven't been able to give proper lectures since, I, mean, I gave some presentations in 2019, but lecture really since I left Dubai 2018. And, uh, in the last video I made, I, I realized I was basically lecturing and I liked it and I missed doing that. And I think in order to give a, a better idea of what I mean by polyliteracy, I'd like to do rather than as I've done in this past month, uh, sort of one-off videos or what, not one-off, I've talked about shadowing for a while and scriptorium, uh, but I would like to do a series <coughs> of, of lectures on uh, polyliteracy, giving background to it, describing building up to it. Because obviously, if you're ever gonna become polyliterate, you have to learn, you have to get that obsession that poly polyglots, polyliterate people share with learning languages. You have to learn how to learn lots of languages well. And then you have to delve into that older type rather than in the modern spoken type. So, um, this has come up in my, my previous incarnations of videos and uh, some discussions and forums. I think there's a lot of older books that have a lot of value and a lot of older techniques for learning languages that don't get much play. So I'd like to give this lecture series by taking a number of books and giving a structured review or revision of some, some useful past guides that I don't know that I would encourage anybody to buy. Um, Robert A. Hall's New Ways to Learn a Foreign Language. Originally wrote it in 1960, revised it in 1980, um, because a lot of it is very dated. It's also, I think, a fairly obscure book, but um, 
I think this is the kind of book that deserved at some point to be used as a textbook and a course uh, in polyglottery, polyliteracy, um, and I don't think it ever got that chance. So I'd like to give it that chance. So I'd like to start with this and maybe go on to um, Gethin and Gunemark's Art and Science of Learning Languages and work through that with you. And then maybe if we're going to continue talking about polyliteracy, you need to learn older ancient languages, maybe give a, a full course in historical linguistics using Campbell's book. This is this is current. This is not older. And then a lot of people are interested in the books that I have behind me on my shelves, texts for polyliteracy, looking at some particular books that you might want to read and consider making manuscripts of or consider internalizing somehow if you can uh, find we'll find a way to make the sounds of them so that you can make them come alive uh, in, in, in resonate in your in your head so what I'd like to do if uh, maybe I could ask you to vote uh, if you'd like to have me continue making uh, just more separate videos or have this sort of connected series He's got five sections here, so maybe the next five videos would be an overview of each section. And again, I would give a review of his structured presentation of how you go about learning language, everything that's involved, uh, and revise it and give my critique of it, my updates, my things like this, and highlight in particular how you might take one approach to this if you're interested in modern spoken language, that is in becoming a polyglot, and you might take a slightly different approach if you are more interested in becoming polyliterate, learning ancient diachronic languages. And then here's the real innovation because I've figured there's so many different ways that we can communicate these days. Um, rather than having a follow-up video like I'm doing right now, I'd like to have a follow-up Zoom discussion circle. I think discussion circles, we have a group of five, six people who are really kind of on the same page in terms of their interest and preparation to discuss the uh, material they have um, is the, the best, the ultimate sort of seminar way of, of learning. So I'd like to invite uh, uh, people to, um, from those who I look at and you know, people can ask and I'll somehow look, but I see lots of people who are really contributing numerous uh, comments and engaging in conversations already in the comment section to my videos. So I'd like to take turn, go in turn and invite uh, some people to come to, um, here he is right on schedule, um, to come to um, come to a Zoom discussion with me uh, and we can film that. And I would like to ask each person who comes to that to present first uh, the question or concern of somebody else who didn't get to come this time and then present a comment or concern of theirs and their own. So we can hopefully have a very interesting, stimulating conversation about the first section. If I do the first section next time, if we decide to do this, um, uh, we will have a very interesting, stimulating conversation about that, film that and present that so that others can watch it. And uh, then next time, in the second section, uh, we'll invite a different group of people to come to that discussion circle. So. Um, yeah, let's uh, give me some feedback if that is something that appeals to you um, or if you would prefer me to continue. Uh, I've gotten a lot of requests for many different types of specific videos. Uh, I could do those as well. So thank you very much for your interest and for listening and goodbye.